We can gather our seats. We're about ready for the start of the evening sessions of lessons. I have two sessions this evening. Uh, this one, we're going to be starting in just a few minutes. And then a uh, uh, second session after that, that'll begin at 8 o'clock. This evening, we're, we're privileged uh, to have two great speakers, and uh, we'll start the 7 o'clock service with a uh, song and then a prayer that will be led by Jonathan Estes, and then uh, I'll introduce the speaker. Let us begin by singing number 702, Trials Dark on Every Hand, number 702. Let's sing the first and last verses. <clears throat> Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story when well, we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful and appreciative of creating us, of allowing us to wake up this morning, creating this world, dear Lord, for us. We're so thankful for the life that you give us, the opportunities, the people in our lives, our families, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the health that allows us to be here. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the ways that you sustain us. We're thankful that your son Jesus came to this earth and died for us. We're thankful that he was perfect. We're thankful that you sent your spirit to live within us, dear Lord, and to help us as we go throughout our days. We're thankful for the people in this auditorium tonight, the love that they have for you, for your church, for your son Jesus, for the people of this world. And we just ask, dear Lord, as you... As we go throughout our days to strive to teach, to strive to love, to strive to be who you would have us to be in the lives of those that we come in contact with. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity tonight to dig into your word, to grow, to glean. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for the speakers that have come our way. We're so thankful for the abilities that you give them. We're so thankful for their service. Dear Lord, we love you so much, and we just ask that you be with us as we seek to live for you. Help us to take the abilities that you give us and to use them for your glory each and every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to introduce the speaker for this session, Brother John DeBerry. Uh, we've had um, great speakers who've made great commitments to be with us. I think uh, those of you that were here at the 3 o'clock hour understand that Jeff has spent, Jenkins has spent three, three weeks out of the country, held a gospel meeting or some kind of event in North Carolina and came here straight for that. 
Brother John Deberry just finished a gospel meeting in Pulaski, Tennessee, and drove here to be with us here this evening. And we certainly appreciate the sacrifices that, that these men, as well as all the others, have spoken to us through this lectureship. John's a, been a distinguished member of government. He currently serves as Governor Bill Lee's senior advisor in the state of Tennessee. We could spend all night talking about those credentials. He's an esteemed member of the board of directors at Freed Harmon University, where Jeff and I have the privilege of serving with him. But more important, he's an esteemed gospel preacher. And we are in for a real treat to have him here to give us the word of God. I recently had the opportunity to speak in chapel at Freed Harmon, and, and John was before me, and he was leading the opening prayer. He probably won't remember this. He made a few comments before the opening prayer, and I felt like I should have just gone back to my seat because there wasn't anything else I could say. Brother John, we're glad to have you with us, and please come preach to us. When I was a young man, I used to follow my father everywhere he went. He was a hero to me because of the way he carried himself as a gospel minister, as my father, as a husband, as a role model, as a mentor, as a fun guy to be with, go fishing. And I used to love to follow him, and you may have heard me on a tape or something tell this story before, but it has a lot to do with the way I look at life now and a lot of the things that I think about that go back to my father, my mother, my grandfather, grandmother, great-grandfather, and great-grandmother, three generations of Christians that surrounded us with love and care, concern, and they provoked us to do those things that God wanted us to do. My father was a Korean War veteran, era veteran, he had come home, his family was growing. I think there were four of us at that particular time. So I know Dad had at least two jobs, pro probably three. He was a working man and he went to school at the same time. He had a job at what, a place called Forest Hill Cemetery. And Forest Hill Cemetery is the place where they laid Elvis for a little while before they moved him back to Graceland. But back in that day, my dad was the guy who would lock up the cemetery. So he had a bunch of keys like Mr. Green Jeans that he rattled all the time when he went to lock up the cemetery. And I remember as he would tell me, and because I would hold on to his britches for, daylight, for dear life as he walked through that cemetery. I probably was in the third or fourth grade at, the, at that particular time. And eventually, Everywhere he went, I was right there with him. And he eventually said, Nick, he said, these aren't the people you need to worry about in here. He said, the people in here are not going to bother you. He said, when we get outside of here, that's when you start worrying about people. But you don't worry about people when you're around here. And time and time again, he would give me lessons like that, telling me that I had to be have be courageous. I remember in the civil rights days when he was one of those, he went to Washington in 63. He marched with Dr. King, we did, in, in the 60s there in Memphis. And the thing that always impressed me about him was his eternal optimism and love for this nation. He had an American flag up on the wall. He had his uniform hanging there. We eventually lost uh, that in, in a house fire, but he taught us to say the Pledge of Allegiance when we were children. So when I went to the first grade, I was one of the few kids who already knew the Pledge because my dad had his children to say it. So his time as being a worker in civil rights was not 
to destroy America, but to strengthen it. And he said, oh, don't worry. There's nowhere else better to live. He says, we'll get it right. We just have to all work together. And I watched black men and white men and black women and white women and Jews and Christians and others work together there in Memphis. And literally, with courage and integrity, they changed the world. Not just the country, but they changed the world. And the relevance of that is something that he told me during that particular time. I, we were integrating the schools in 68. And I was telling one of the elders who brought me in, it was the providence of God because I would never have found out about Freed Hardeman if we had not integrated the schools in 68. And he said, when we were getting ready to go to the school, I think my youngest brother said, Daddy, there's not going to be any more colored children there because colored was the term at that particular time. He said, I don't think there's going to be any other colored, there's not going to be any other colored children there. And my dad told me when I was asking him, what do we do when we go to that school? He said, you don't scratch your head when it ain't itching, Nick. You don't grin when it ain't funny. You just be a man. You act like a man. You give respect, you'll get respect. And he said to Edward, my brother, he said, Edward, you can't stop being colored. So I guess you got to stop being afraid. And that was something that stuck to me to this day as he talked to my younger brother on telling him, just stop being afraid. And when you think about a lot that's going on in this nation right now, a lot of the division, the malice, the hatred, a lot of the stereotypical thoughts that we have about one another that are dividing this country from within, Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first to say it. Jesus was the first to say it. That a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, you say, Brother Deberry, what does that have to do with, with being able to be, have courage and being brave in, the, in this present world? It has everything to do with it. Because Jesus wasn't crucified in some, some temple. Jesus wasn't crucified in some hygienic place where there were folks watching. He was nailed on a Roman cross by a bunch of crooked politicians, hung between two thieves on a garbage heap on the outside of Jerusalem called the Place of the Skull because rotting bodies and dogs and buzzards and terrible smell and terrible sounds, our Savior, Jesus Christ, took his last breath as a human being on that rotting dump on the outside of Jerusalem. And he's the one that told us, I have overcome the world. In essence, Jesus, as Peter said, who knew no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. If I am going to look at anybody to find out how I make it in a world that's filled with evil, Raft, hatred, malice, prejudice, murder, mayhem, killing, lies, hypocrisy. I can turn to my Lord and my Savior because he dealt with every bit of it and none of it made him sin. None of it made him fall. He left this world and took his last breath as a human being saying, it is finished, meaning as our perpetuation, our substitute, nobody had done it before. Abraham didn't do it. Isaac didn't do it. Jacob didn't do it. Solomon, David didn't do it. None of them did it. Moses, Noah, every last one of them sinned. Nobody had been able to resist the devil's perfect trifecta that John tells us about when John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world, according to John, is the devil's perfect trifecta, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And he uses it with perfection to make men and women fall from the very beginning of time. Nobody has been able to stand and say no but Jesus. Turn those stones to bread. No. 
jump off this mountain. No. Bow down to me. No. Nobody had said no to those things that the devil places before us in an evil world until Jesus came. Jesus told us and and in making us, as the prophet said, let us reason together. Jesus is trying to make you reason when he says, What doth it profit a man? What have you gained? If you should gain the whole world, what's the whole world? John told you. The Bible interprets itself. The whole world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Jesus said, What have you gained? If you should gain the whole world and lose your own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Lord is saying, what's the price of your sellout? What's the price of your sellout in this world of sin and corruption? What's the price of your sellout in this world filled with materialism and worldliness and lies, men who call good evil and evil good? The Lord is saying, what have you gained when you sell your very self? Because in that vernacular from the Greek, what he is saying is, what have you gained? You get the whole world, but you lose your soul. That word soul in that context means you lost yourself. Who you were, what you intended to be, what your plans, your godly plans, what your spirit spiritual capability, possibilities, and potential was, it's all gone. It's all gone. Because you settle for the crumbs that fall from the devil's table. And the Lord said, what have you profited? When we look at this world today, each and every one of us have to understand something. Life is about decisions and the consequences of those decisions. In essence, the Lord holds you accountable and he holds you responsible. Just because this world is evil, we talk about, oh, Lord, the world is evil. Oh, Lord, the world is sinful. Oh, Lord, folks hate each other. Oh, Lord, folks killing each other. They were doing the same thing in the day of Christ. And Jesus said to each and every one of us, they hated me and they're going to hate you also. And I send you forth as sheep among wolves. And that's what the Lord is saying. Don't come belly aching to me when I put on the flesh. I came from heaven. As the scriptures say, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus put on the flesh, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. Why? Just so he could experience earth, take a vacation from heaven? No. He did it so he could die for our sins, because unless he does it, we have no redemption. We have no salvation. There is no plan B. Well, if Jesus decided when God, when Jesus prayed the scariest prayers in the history of mankind is when Jesus lay down in that garden with sweat and blood rolling down his face. There's so much tension in this young 30-year-old man because he's got to take the weight of the sin of all mankind on his shoulders. He's got to take the hand of God and the hand of man and bring us back together in at one mint. We call the word atonement. At one mint is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he prayed, Father, Father, if you don't mind me paraphrasing, do I have to do this also? Father, do I have to take that scourging? Father, do you know what they're going to do to me? Father, do you know how they're going to mistreat me and abuse me and torment me? Father, do I have to take this cup also? Lord have mercy. What if God had said, you know what, son? They ain't worth it. They haven't done anything but torment you. 
mistreat you your whole life. You never hurt anybody, and all you've done is good. No, son, you get on heaven's, heaven's elevator. I'm just sitting in the cloud right now. You come home, and I'll do to them what I should have done when Adam and Eve sinned. What if God had done that? Thank God Jesus got up and said, that's all right, Father. I'm going to die for him. That's okay. I came to die. I'm going to die. I'm not going to let them down. I'm not going to quit on them. I'm not going to walk away from their salvation. I'm not going to leave them without redemption. Jesus didn't give up on you. Why do we give up on him? Why is it the minute we have trouble? Don't you know Peter, before he died, Peter wasn't worrying about the fact that he was going to be crucified. He wasn't worried about the fact that he was going to lose his life. He wasn't worried about the fact that he and the apostles, one by one, beginning with James, that they put a sword in his belly that came out of his back. One by one, they died. Peter wasn't worried about that. You know what Peter was worried about? He was worried about the church enduring, being strong, being committed, having courage, and not quitting when the troubles came. He said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 8, Peter said, be sober, be sober, be vigilant. In other words, don't get drunk with fear. Don't get drunk with pride, materialism, worldliness. Don't get distracted by the things of this world. Be sober. Be vigilant. He said, because your adversary, that word adversary in that context comes from a term which means your opponent. Your opponent. Folks say the devil is your enemy. The devil not your enemy. The devil is God's enemy, and he's already beat him. He's your opponent. He's your adversary. He wants to box with you and wrestle with you. He has no authority over you. He's a liar and a usurper. He promises what he can't deliver. He makes threats that he can't carry out. You have to give him the power over you because he cannot take it from you. That's why Peter said, be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, your opponent, calls his name the devil. As a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. What are you saying, Peter? The devil is like a hunter. I remember back in Crockett County, when we would go hunting, you put decoys out. And the ducks up high can stay up high in safety. But they see the decoy, that must be safe down there. Let's go down. And the minute they land, we go to shooting. Fact of the matter is, they were decoyed from safety. And that's what the devil's trying to do to you. Why don't you try this? Do this. Taste this. Go here. Be this. Listen to this. Adhere to this. Follow this. And that's what he's trying to do. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Open your eyes. If you're going to have courage and be able to survive, and endure in this present world, you got to open your eyes. Too many of us are caught up in naivety. We sit down on the seat of do nothing, lean back on the elbows of do less, and say, wake me up when the fight is over. Don't you understand you are a warrior? That you're God's warriors, you're soldiers of the cross? That you have a responsibility of fighting the good fight of faith? Paul said to the brethren in Ephesians chapter 6, somewhere around verses 10, Paul said to the brethren, the, he said, be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand. Listen to that word. And every military man and woman in this room Understand what that word stands mean. Stand is not invade. Stand is not ambush. You stand when the disputed territory is already won. You stand when you've already fought for certain perimeters and have secured them. You stand 
to hold what you got. God has already won the battle. Jesus has already defeated the enemy. He tells us, be courageous. Don't quit. Stop being cowards before the devil and stand. Paul said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, look at that next word, against. Paul understood the Roman legions. When those Roman soldiers, those huge, tall, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, burly, 2, 3, and 400 pound men put their shields side by side. And they would stand against the enemy with their javelins coming between the shields. And they would walk forward. They moved forward because they stood against. And Paul said, you stand against the wiles of the devil. He said, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not fighting people. You're not fighting Leroy, Bubba, Cockroach, and Skillet. He says, you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's as Paul said, you got to get your eyes off of a few folks who have been caught in the devil's prison camp and look at those who are changing the world by changing the laws, by changing the rules, by changing God's law of marriage, by changing God's laws of life, by changing God's laws of gender. He says, you're fighting these people, not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world. What do you need to do in this world? You need to stand. That means you can't withdraw like too many of us as Christians. We want to withdraw and say, well, it's not my fight. It's not my battle. Oh, yes, it is your fight. And yes, it is your battle. When I look around this room and I see these babies, you probably heard me say it before. I was one of those who was throwing up my hand. I sat on the floor of the House of Representatives for 26 years. And I remember one day over 20 years ago when I sat on the floor and I listened to the debate as they talked about things that made absolutely no sense and stood at variance against the law of God. I threw my hands up and said, you know what? It's not worth saving. It's too far gone. It's already gone down the tube. Speaking about America, ready to throw my hands up, walk off the floor, and not run again. And God got me real good, real good. You know what he did? He gave me grandchildren. <laughs> he gave me grandchildren. And when that little girl wrapped her hand around my finger and looked me in the eye, I said, okay, God, I got it. I got it. She deserves everything I have, and we got to fight for it. I would hate to see the world these children, these beautiful children in this room, are going to have to grow up in 10 and 20 years from now if we don't stand right now, if we don't fight right now, vote right now, find the right people to put in charge Right now, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs chapter 14, Solomon said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That word reproach comes from a Hebrew word which basically means a shame. It is like a poison. It is like a rot that rottens people from within. And he said, righteousness will exalt. God sent you. You got to be courageous. God didn't send the politicians with their partisan political biases, stereotypical judgments, and personal animosities to save the world. He sent you to save it. He didn't send the academians with their pompous self-worship prefixes and suffixes on their names, pseudoscience and atheistic zeal and spiritual blindness. 
He sent you to save the world. He didn't send the medical professionals with their God complex disrespect of the unborn and who only respect that which they can dissect and understand in medical research. No, he sent you to save the world. God didn't send the media, the corporations of America, the military, the theologians, the philosophers at the, that, that look at man's wisdom to save the world. He sent the church. He sent you to save the world. He told you to go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He said on another occasion, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he gave you a promise of assurance. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, the end of the world. In essence, what the love is, the Lord is saying, when Peter, when Peter said to the brethren, I like what he said in verses 9. Because when he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Church, he didn't tell you to run from the devil. He told you to put the devil on the run. That's what the Lord says to us. And it takes courage and commitment. In verse 9, it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, he's destroying the world and God sent you to save it. That word steadfast is interesting in that passage because it's the same steadfast that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58. When Paul said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Listen to what Paul is saying. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 and verses 6, Paul gives you a description of yourself as courageous soldiers of the cross. Paul said, you are the children of light. The children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. In other words, you don't blend in. You don't blend in. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verses 2, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren. I beg you, brethren. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Then Paul said to the brethren, be not conformed, don't blend in. Be not conformed, don't capitulate. Be not conformed, don't compromise to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In essence, when you think different, you'll act different. And Christians have a responsibility to be courageous in this world and show the difference between the holy and the profane. That's what God intends for all of us to do as his children. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through verses 26, Paul lets us know that we have been sent on a rescue mission. You've been sent on a rescue mission. You have not been sent to simply get comfortable. You, you were sent to rescue the world. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 through verses 26, Paul said the servant of the Lord must not strive or condemn, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Notice what he said in verses 25. He said, in meekness, in meekness, meekness is power under control. He didn't tell you to dumb yourself down. He didn't tell you not to quote the scriptures. He's not telling you not to preach what is true. He's not telling you to compromise with false doctrine. 
A horse is just as strong when he's under control. That word meekness has a, a relationship to that horse that when he is broken, as we say, he's just as powerful. He can run just as fast, but now he's under control. Meekness is power under control. God says, use your power for good. In essence, as a Christian in this present world, you've got to know how to use the strong hand and the tender touch. That's what the Lord sent you to do. You've got to be the person that knows how to preach to anybody and what to tell everybody. In meekness, instructing those, notice what Paul said, that oppose themselves. If God preventure, if they are blessed to be so, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's what you'd want to happen. You don't want to throw your hands up and say it ain't worth saving. You don't want to throw your hands up and say it's too far gone. You don't want to throw your hands up and say it ain't worth my time or my effort. What you need to do is what God commanded you to do. Save the world. That's what you need to do. And we can start by saving our own country, by saving our communities, by saving our school systems, by saving our children. We can start by doing that. And if we can do that, then we can do a whole lot towards saving the, girl, uh, the world. You can take the largest stadium in this area, turn out all the lights in that stadium, Turn out all the lights for several blocks around it to where and fill it up with 50,000 people who can't even see the person next to them or the person in front of them. We can send this young man right here out to the 50-yard line. Give him one match, and he can strike that one match, and everybody in the stadium can see that one match. You know why? Because light destroys dark. Lord say, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify the Father in them. How, how am I doing on time? Five minutes or I'm through? Does that mean get out of the pulpit? Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'm all, give me just a second or two. Okay. Ronald Reagan once said something, and I want you to take this with you. Ronald Reagan said this about freedom. He said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. Than one generation from extinction. He said, we don't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, it must be protected, and it must be handed on for them to do the same. Martin Luther King said two things that I want you to take with you. He said, we may have come over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And he said that in 1968 when it looked like the country was trying to destroy itself. And he said, when we, we destroy the country, what we got? Where are we going? He said to the whole nation, we can live together as brothers or we can die together as fools. And I think that those of us who need to have courage in the time in which we live need to think about that. When you're born, I'm looking at all these babies out here. I'm sure that every one of them looked like a parent or a grandparent or maybe even a great-grandparent. Because when we're born into the world, we look like our parents. But when we leave this world, we look like our choices. America's not looking like its forefathers anymore. It's not looking like its parentage anymore. America is looking more and more like our choices. And it's up to those of us who have the courage and patience of the scripture and God's love to stand up and be the difference.
Thank you, John, for such a powerful lesson. But let's have a word of prayer before we dismiss. Gracious Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the privilege that we have to serve you. We're thankful for the power of this lesson to challenge us and encourage us to stand up as Christians, to be counted among those that are trying to save the lost, that we might broaden your kingdom, that we might change this world. Give us the strength and courage to do that as we live our lives every day. It's in your blessed Son's name that we pray. Amen. We'll begin another session in about 10 minutes.